Good day, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Brosnan. I'm part of the Vikela Earth team. And uh, welcome to our Ocean Day webinar. Uh, we've been lucky to assemble a, a wonderful panel of, of presenters. Um, we are two years into Ocean UN Ocean Decade. Um, I think a very few people actually understand the importance of our oceans, our largest ecosystem, also um, the largest carbon zinc, um, and the threats it faces. So I hope that you'll engage our panel today. Uh, feel free to put your hand up, feel free to ask questions. We have specialists in all fields here. Um, and then obviously my love of sharks, we have probably the, bra the greatest brain um, and shark specialist in Alessandra, and I'm keen to hear what he has to uh, say to us today. So I'd like to introduce um, one of our board members, Vikela Earth board members, Virginia Simpson, who also has a handsome resume um, and is very involved in conservation initiatives and upliftment, especially in, in uh, Africa. So uh, over to you, Virginia Simpson. Good luck, guys, and enjoy. Thank you, Mike, and welcome everyone to this Vicali Earth World Ocean Stay webinar. My name is Virginia Simpson, and I'm part of the Vicali Earth team. As Mike just said, I'm based in the UK. And this year's theme, Ocean Day theme, is revitalization of our oceans. Oceans are so important in our fight against climate change, and they also provide us with food and medicine and give millions of people jobs and recreation. Healthy oceans make healthy people. So what are we doing to protect our oceans? That is what our lineup of ocean experts will be talking about today. I also wanted to draw your attention to one of our esteemed board members, Dr. Linda Penfold, who's a research biologist. Um, she's based in Florida. She gave a talk back in April on coral reef crisis, and it's called Adapting to Survive Climate Change Through Reproduction. And I highly recommend you view this 12 minute video later on, which you can find in our YouTube channel. But first, let me briefly touch on a bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, please in your um, Zoom profile, could you put your first and your last name? Um, can you also make sure that you've muted your microphones and we'll open up for questions at the end so you can unmute them. Um, you can also um, post your questions in the Q&A as the speakers you know, as we go along um, and we'll answer them at the end. And also feel free to say hello to everyone, um, copy your LinkedIn profiles, or your email addresses in the chat if you want to um, change, exchange information with like-minded people. So um, we have a range of speakers, which include two passionate generation Zetters and two experienced veterans whose work and research are critical for the future of our oceans. So each talk will be around 10 minutes and we have four speakers. So with further ado, without further ado, um, our first speaker today is Tuli Nkademing. Um, um, Tuli will be speaking about ocean dead zones and what everyone needs to know about them, even if you don't live near an ocean. Um, Tuli is a recent graduate. She's hugely passionate about protecting, preserving, and restoring natural ecosystems. Tuli, over to you. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you to everyone attending, and thank you to Figuela for um, coordinating this event. Um, excuse me, everybody. I know that I've become a part of my virtual background. Please don't, don't worry about that. Um, it's all about the presentation. 
So uh, my name is Tulin Gadi Meng. I'm a recent graduate um, from South Africa, the University of Cape Town, where I studied marine biology and oceanography, which is something I'm very passionate about. And today I would love to talk to you guys about ocean dead zones. Um, whether many people are aware of it or not, our ocean is in a deoxygenation crisis. So I just wanted to talk to you about how we can prevent further loss of oxygen from the ocean. And um, first of all, I wanted to share with you a quote that I love from a prominent researcher in this, um, of this phenomenon. Her name is Denise Breitberg. And she said something that stood out to me. She said, if you can't breathe, nothing else matters. She was speaking about the tragic scenes and circumstances that um, species are faced with when there's ocean dead zones and ocean deoxygenation. So what are dead zones exactly? Dead zone is just a, a term for an area in the ocean that has experienced hypoxia. Now hypoxia is characterized as a state of low oxygen concentration, which then restricts physiological and ecological processes. So quantitatively, scientists have said that an area has hypoxia when it has below two milligrams of oxygen per liter of water. This is a very technical term. So um, I just wanted to note that I'll be using the term deoxygenation throughout this presentation, which is just a term for general decline in oxygen. Um, there are four types of dead zones, which is which character, categorize according to the duration of hypoxia. So we've got dial cycling dead zones, which have a night day cycle of um, decreased oxygen. Then we have seasonal dead zones. These are the most common types of dead zones which occur um, in one to two seasons of the year. We have temporary dead zones, and then we have permanent dead zones. Now, the reason they're called dead zones is because they're unable to support forms of life. So um, when aquatic species can't escape fast enough or escape at all, they will most likely die in these um, low oxygen levels or they'll just become very lethargic. So how do dead zones form? Now, first, I do want to note that dead zones, well, hypoxia and dead zones are naturally occurring phenomenon. But I'll be talking about human induced hypoxia, which happens when nutrient pollution causes eutrophication. So human induced hypoxia happens when fresh water carrying high concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus enter a salt water environment. Now when this happens, this causes an algal bloom. An algal bloom is uh, excess plant matter growth. And the problem is not necessarily in the algal bloom itself. What happens is when this um, unconsumed alg algae dies, it, it sinks down to the bottom of the water column where it's um, decomposed by bacteria. Now these bacteria use up a majority of the oxygen present in, the, in these environments. And that's what leads to dead zones the lack of oxygen. Okay. So now we're gonna look at the causes of dead zones. Um, the two main causes would be agricultural uh, nutrient pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. So agricultural runoff occurs when surface water from um, agriculture leads um, into natural waterways such as rivers, lakes, um, natural uh, wetlands and this can cause flooding and nutrient pollution. So when we were talking about the nitrogen and phosphorus that enter the waterways, this is where it can come from. Greenhouse gas emissions also directly impact um, on the open ocean. So they are deposited onto the ocean by the atmosphere. Then we have urban wastewater and animal waste. So these also introduce excess nutrients uh, into waterways. And then climate change intensifies ocean dead zones. And we're gonna talk about how it does that a little bit later. So when we look at where these dead zones are, 
we see that no area is exempt from the consequences of ocean dead zones. And we also see that it's not just a coastal problem. These extend far into the open ocean and um, some of the areas most heavily affected by dead zones are some of the most productive regions, such as the Northern Gulf of Mexico. We have the upwelling regions of California um, and the Baltic and Mediterranean Sea are also affected by hypoxia. Now, dead zones could be getting worse. Researchers have found that the number of dead zones has increased dramatically since the 1960s. And so far, researchers have identified 415 dead zones, um, but they expect that there are a lot more than this because developing regions don't have a lot of dead zone monitoring. So um, there could be many dead zones that have gone undetected. Additionally, open ocean dead zone area has increased as well. So the area in the open ocean, which is considered a dead zone has increased and climate change is intensifying deoxygenation. So we all know that um, the ocean can be a buffer against climate change, but as climate change continues to occur, we're gonna see that warming sea temperatures are going to increase stratification. Stratification is just the separation of um, water, water with different qualities, so different dent densities and temperatures. So now if stratification increases, this is gonna prevent deeper and shallower waters from mixing, meaning that deeper waters will be less aerated, thus have less oxygen. So now another thing that climate, climate change is also doing is that it's gonna warm our water the ocean water. And um, water already has a tough time holding and dissolving oxygen, but it's gonna be able to hold less oxygen when it is warming. Hmm. Um, warmer water also supports the development of harmful algal blooms and harmful algal blooms threaten water quality. Uh, with climate change, we're expecting an intensity in uh, the intensity of heavy rainfall events to increase, which would increase runoff. Um, now this is gonna um, come back to where excess nutrients are coming back into waterways. So then, and also climate change is as a result of increased CO2. Um, increased CO2 promotes algae growth, which is gonna mean that there's more algae which can um, sink down to the bottom and decompose. I also wanted to note that as other anthropogenic um, stresses worsen, such as acidification, uh, plastic pollution, overfishing, these are gonna have a compounded effect along with deoxygenation and increase ocean ecosystem vulnerability. So what effects do dead zones have on marine ecosystems? So research has shown that insufficient oxygen can reduce survival, growth, and reproduction of ocean, for, of ocean aquatic life. So we're gonna see a loss of biodiversity, change in community composition and species ab abundance. So this means what species are present in an environment and um, in what amount they're there. Uh, we're gonna see changes in food web structure, loss of ecosystem functions, habitat compression, for example, tunas, which have very high metabolisms, have been seen to be found in, in um, shallower waters now because um, deeper waters have less oxygen. And we're gonna see nitrous oxide formation. Nitrous oxide is a very strong heat trapping gas, more powerful than CO2, and it, uh, it affects the ozone layer. So, the part that most people want to know about, effects of dead zones on human society. Um, so we're going to see a loss in seafood provisions, and this is going to take the form of food insecurity for those who depend on um, seafood as their main source of protein. Um, the fishing industry is going to be hit hard with the quality and size of harvestable biomass from the ocean is decreasing tourism, these tend to be very noxious and unattractive events. So we're gonna see a decrease in um, business for those who depend on coastal waters for attraction. Then we're gonna see 
harmful algal blooms, threatening drinking water for humans and terrestrial animals. So this is another thing people inland need to consider, that this is not just a coastal problem, this is going to threaten um, drinking water for all of us. And then we're going to see a loss of carbon sink habitat, such as seagrass, because when an algal bloom occurs, it's going to cover the water, and this prevents sunlight from penetrating through. This means that those seagrass environments can't photosynthesize, so they will die. Now, what I'm really excited to speak to you guys about is revitalization. So this is the UN's theme for World Oceans Day this year. And um, they were really pushing collective actions for ocean revitalization. So that's what I'm really excited to speak about because we don't just wanna hear about problems. We wanna know that there's solutions to our problems. Um, so that's what I, I'm really excited to talk about. So the good news is that dead zones can recover. Um, so the three key ways in which they can recover is that we need to address nutrient pollution and climate change causing dead zones. We need to protect the animals endangered by dead zones and improve scientific monitoring. Now, um, when, I, when I'm speaking about these collective actions for dead zone reduction, prevention, um, I do want to say that we can't just address dead zones on their own because with other anthropogenic stresses, if we improve in preventing dead zones, they can come and counteract any progress we make. So we do still need to address things like climate change, which also contribute to the formation of dead zones. And as we continue to um, find out more about how dead zones affect our oceans, we need to make sure that we're assessing and addressing the impacts of ocean deoxygenation through adaptive planning. The Gulf of Mexico dead zone. I decided to use this as an example for how um, there have been collective efforts made towards reducing dead zones. This is one of the most well-studied and well-known dead zones. So it's in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And as you can see here, um, the darker red colors show where there's the least amount of oxygen. Um, this is the general shape it keeps, but it changes in size from year to year, depending on the nutrient pollution it experiences. It is the second largest dead zone in the world at an average of 4,000 square kilometers, of oh, square miles, sorry. Um, but uh, this is a five-year average, and it's a little bit smaller than the previous five-year average. So that, that does show some progress, um, but it does go up and down in size from year to year. The Mississippi River watershed is what uh, produces this dead zone. It, it encompasses 41% of the United States, um, the continental United States. So this river watershed is coming from inland and specifically from America's breadbasket, which is the large agricultural region in the middle of America. So all this large agricultural region uses lots of fertilizers. These fertilizers hold nitrogen and phosphorus. And this is what enters the waterways and makes it all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, causing deoxygenation. This dead zone specifically is present in the summer and any organism that cannot escape fast enough, they die off in large numbers. And this, uh, this area has a large impact on the seafood industry and provides more than 40% of the country's seafood. Um, uh, species such as the brown shrimp and the Atlantic croaker have been severely um, affected by deoxygenation. The level of shrimp being found has, has severely decreased. So now how is this being dealt with? The Gulf of Mexico, um, there was a task force created in 1997. Um, this is called the hypoxia task force and it coordinates efforts to reduce the size, duration, and severity of hypoxia in the Gulf. Now, um, this, this has been a pretty successful effort. It is very difficult to coordinate over that many states, um, but they, there has been nu nutrient reduction practices and technologies implemented across the Mississippi River watershed. And, um, the task force continues to monitor and forecast the, the hypoxic zone and, and conduct impact studies. Um, they also uh, provide educational tools to raise awareness and individual states support farmers who can implement practices to protect the water quality. 
So with uniform monitoring in the Gulf of, Me in the Gulf of Mexico, we've been able to better understand hypoxia and um, how it affects ocean ecosystems. So I'm gonna talk about some general short-term solutions um, that we can all push for specifically in government and industry. So um, I did want to mention that we need to be able to raise awareness for what is at stake and the consequences of further deoxygenation. We need policies managing the overuse of fertilizers. We need to implement strategies that prevent urban and ag agricultural runoff from entering natural um, waterways. Stop sewage dumping. It's still crazy to me that sewage can be directly dumped into waterways. That should not be happening at all. Um, and we need to make sure we improve urban and agricultural waste management. Reduction in, in greenhouse gases. We need to repair and protect riparian systems, including deoxygenation as, a, as an important element of fisheries management is also very important. Um, when protecting fishery, when, when planning for fisheries, we need to ensure that we are um, uh, factoring in the fact that deoxygenation is happening and how it's affecting uh, fish populations. And we also need to fund the development of clean energy and technology and consume less animal products. Long-term solutions, so this would be in the span of the next five to 10 years, hopefully. Uh, we need to make sure we find more sustainable means of fertilizing crops, make clean energy the standard, Active greenhouse gas removal is very important. It is a very difficult thing to do, but um, I'm hoping that we can be able to do that in the near future. Uh, hypoxia research networks need to be established in developing nations. Developing nations are um, have a problem with a lack of uh, dead zone uh, monitoring and even um, the, at first even recognizing that we have dead zones. And then we need wetland restoration in nitrogen hotspots. So it's important that we restore wetlands and riparian systems, but it's also important as to where we repair them. We need to make sure that the restoration is happening in nitrogen hotspots. So these are areas with high nitrogen concentrations. Um, we need to make sure we recycle our waste, especially um, agricultural waste and improve waste management facilities in urban areas as well. So I know that um, a lot of people find it a little bit discouraging if we have to wait for government and industry and different companies to make efforts. So I just wanted to make a short list of things that we can all do um, starting today to make sure that we decrease our greenhouse gas emissions and uh, nutrient pollution. So if we can choose phosphate-free cleaning supplies and soaps for our household, choose water efficient appliances, um, such as toilets, showers, shower, shower heads, um, we can use less electricity, we can drive more efficiently. So if we can carpool, do all of your errands at one time, um, and if you can use alternative means of transport uh, when possible, we can all plant native species in our gardens and minimize runoff in our gardens and always clean up our pet waste, especially those of us who live near natural waterways. Um, so yes, I know that a lot of these we've all heard before, but I think if we can make a little bit of a push to um, make sure that we all are putting an effort to uh, reduce our emissions, that'd be great. I wanted to end off with some success stories just to make everyone uh, feel a little bit better. There has been progress made um, this is not a, an insurmountable uh, problem. Um, so we've seen that in the Black Sea, benthic communities are slowly recovering since nutrients were reduced in the 1990s. The Baltic Sea, for example, um, has surrounding nations were able to come together and substantially reduce nutrient levels through the sustainable farming methods and improving sewage treatment. We've got um, on the East Coast of America, we've got examples like Narragansett Bay and Chesapeake Bay, which had hypoxia reduction. So state incentives have, state incentives have actually caused farmers to adjust their farming practices and mitigate um, pollution from their land. 
um, so reducing nutrient loading. So um, I just wanted to leave you guys with those success stories. Thank you for listening. And I hope that um, you learned something today about dead zones. Thank you. Tuli, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions about dead zones, but we also have learned a lot um, during your talk. Um, so we're going to move on to the next speaker, Alessandro, if you could get your presentation up. Okay, thank you very much uh, to Vikila Earth Conservation for uh, inviting me at this uh, special event. My name, as you can see, is Alessandro de Maddalena, and I spent uh, uh, the largest part of my life uh, studying sharks and doing research about sharks. So starting from, from the mid of the 90s, so it's now almost uh, 30 years. So let me share my screen. Uh, my first interest uh, has been uh, the great white shark and still the great white shark. And then uh, clearly all species of sharks starting uh, from studying the great white shark presence in the Mediterranean Sea and then in other parts of the world, but also studied uh, many other species like the mega shark, the six gill shark, the hammerhead shark, etc. This also took me to write a lot of books about shark biology, 20 to date, many, too many, <laughs> and a lot of scientific papers and articles, also for popular magazines. I think that uh, for people that are specialists uh, in different fields, uh, it is very important that uh, as specialists, we talk uh, to general people, we talk to a general audience. This is why I also wrote so many uh, articles for popular magazines like uh, Wildlife or Scuba Diving magazines, and I gave uh, so many lectures around the world. And this is why I, I'd be happy to accept this invitation. So let's talk about the great white shark. Everybody knows that people are very interested in great whites, uh, mainly, I think, because they are potentially dangerous animals. And from the 75, when uh, Jaws came out, the famous movie by Spielberg, all the world got immediately interested in great whites. These animals clearly scare most of people, but also are incredibly fascinating. And I think that the main reason why a lot of people are actually interested in great whites, just because they are so beautiful and also very big animals, they can attain a maximum total length of 6.5 meters. And uh, I've been lucky to be able to observe these animals uh, in South Africa, where I took this picture, for example, this was uh, from Gasby, and also their sites in uh, South African waters, mainly Falls Bay. I'm talking to you now in this moment from Falls Bay. I'm located in Simonstown, so that's uh, south of Cape Town. And uh, like everybody knows, it's a very important site because uh, it has been the very first uh, site uh, where it's been possible to document uh, the behavior, the breaching behavior of great whites, uh, that uh, a wonderful job that has been done by Chris Fallos, uh, Rob Lawrence here in uh, uh, Falls Bay. So uh, it was the very first time that uh, the breaching behavior of the great whites, uh, breaching uh, around sunrise to catch the seals has been uh, properly documented. So taking photos, filming, describing from a scientific point of view, publishing papers on this. Uh, and clearly now everybody knows about this behavior, this very fascinating behavior. But uh, at the time, only a few decades ago, only nobody knows about uh, this kind of predatory strategy. Uh, it's so beautiful because uh, you see, you can see the natural selection in front of you. And you can not just understand, but also see how it's important that these animals survive because they are such an important component of the uh, ecological system of the, of the oceans. Great white sharks can be found all over the world. So you will find them in South Africa, also in South Australia, in Mexico, but also in Mediterranean Sea, in New England waters, New Zealand, Japan, everywhere. You, you are not going to find them in Antarctic, uh, uh, Arctic waters, but let's say that you can find them everywhere because also they favor temperate cold waters. So, for example, South African waters uh, that are usually 
uh, around, uh, from, let's say from 11 to 17 degrees uh, average, like 14 degrees, that's a perfect place for them. But they can also venture in much warmer waters. This is why you find them at sometimes in tropical waters. This picture has been taken uh, at the uh, Neptune Islands in South Australia. That's a marvelous site uh, that also show you how it's important to protect not just the shark, but also its habitat. The Neptune Islands in uh, South Australia have been uh, a protected area for quite a long time now. And you can see the result, the environment it's beautiful, the sharks are alive. They can feed there, they can stay there, they can periodically come back on the site. And the, let's say they are kind of safe there, you know? And uh, it's beautiful to see also that uh, uh, when you work with these animals, you have the chance to work with a lot of people that are uh, into conservation, but also into research of these animals. You learn a lot of facts uh, and that's uh, really fascinating. So that's another image from South Australia. And in South Australia, for example, you see they do cage diving like they do in Guadalupe or here in South Africa, but also they have a very special cage that goes down on the bottom of the ocean and that's unique in the world. So you can actually go down, usually will be around 18, 20 meters, sometimes up to 30 meters depth. And then you can observe the great whites in their own world, just, uh, you know, swimming at the bottom. This is great because many times you are waiting for the great white uh, at the surface, like we do all the time in South Africa. But uh, many times they are not coming to the cage at the surface just because they don't want to. A lot of people think that the great whites learn to associate the presence of humans with the presence of food in the water if you do activity like shark feeding or cage diving. Now, I, I really don't like much shark feeding. That means feeding the shark on purpose all the time to show the sharks to the people, to the tourists. I think that uh, we must be very careful when we work with these wild animals. So I think uh, it's uh, correct to not feed uh, the sharks, they are wild animals. But we still need to use some kind of attractant for the sharks. So we need to use some charm, you know, some uh, small amount of tiny part of, uh, of pieces of fish and uh, also oil, uh, blood from fishes, clearly. And uh, also we need to use bait, but the bait must be properly managed. So the shark is not able to can to eat the bait uh, all the time, you know, but as less as possible. That's you see a very a close up of great white coming to check uh, on the cage on the bottom. This was really beautiful, intimate moment. <laughs> and that's uh, one of the biggest great white I've been able to observe so far. It, it was a 5.5 meters. That's a female at the Neptune Islands. Uh, is, uh, she's nicknamed the Jumbo. People think that the uh, large great whites are all around. You can see them all the time, but that's uh, actually the, Average size of these animals is just 3.5 meters. Just, uh, but uh, I mean, a 3.5 meter great white uh, is very messy, it's very heavy. So it's already a very big animal. It just that uh, it's not common to see great white that are larger than, than five meters, you know? Uh, that's uh, Guadalupe, clear waters, you know? And that's uh, beautiful and also warm waters. But also I think that the most important thing when you go diving with great whites, you respect the rules. So it is very important to choose operators that are really uh, ecologically oriented. So they are not going to work in a way that may put in danger the health of the shark, the safety of the divers. So the respect for the animals and the respect for the people you take in the water it's fundamental. Uh, sadly, there are some very good operators, some operator that is so-so, some bad operator too, because we must tell the things are they are. And the problem is that the bad operators give a bad name to all other operators. So it's very important that there is control from the authority 
So the, 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 you can see that the, all the operators follow a certain standard. So for example, you saw many times in documentaries, the sharks bumping the cage, eating the cage sometimes very violently. That's not good clearly because then the animal can injure themselves. They are very heavy. They can reach a speed of uh, about 50 kilometers per hour. So if you put uh, the bait too close to the bars of the cage, clearly is not safe for the people in the cage and it is not safe for the shark. So just need to manage the bait properly. And uh, since the, the shark at the end of the day may succeed to take the bait, it's very important. The bait is small and there is not much, uh, let's say, meat or fatty tissues that can actually feed the shark. So for example, using off pulse of fishes from, a, from a, the fishing industry, that's a good way because you are not killing extra animals and you are using parts of the animals that are not going to actually feed the shark. Vertebral column, tail of a fish, part of the gill structure, that's good because it's not going to feed the shark. So, you know, uh, when I said that many people think that the shark is going to associate the presence of food in the water, which means the bait, basically, with the presence of humans. And many people think that this will lead to more attacks on humans. Now, this is very wrong. There's nothing true about it. Now, there are decades of activities of shark diving, cage diving, shark feeding, all of that, all over the world, there is not a single spot where these kind of activities led to an increase of attacks. Actually, I was talking just a few weeks ago with my friend and colleague, Andrew Fox, who uh, works in South Australia, and he was telling me, you know, the fact that uh, we use the bait to attract the shark actually make them less interested in the boats and the people and the, the divers because after a while, a certain shark will learn that we are not going to give them the food. And even when they get that food, there is, as I said, almost nothing for them on that pain, you know? So they actually learn to get less interested in humans when you are doing this kind of activities on the side. Now, I think that uh, cage diving and also uh, shark diving in general is very important as a tool to teach people that we must protect these animals. We see, you see this picture, you see, we see many sharks with hooks uh, inside uh, their mouth, stuck uh, usually at the corner of the mouth. Sometimes these hooks fr come from a long lining. Sometimes they come from a sport fisherman and sometimes they come from poachers. So even in the countries like in South Africa where this species is protected, there are still threat for them. Because if I kill a shark and I am a fisherman, I don't want maybe to kill the shark, but if it's by catch, which means if I was fishing for some other species, but by mistake, I kill the shark, it doesn't matter if the species is protected, it's dead anyway. And another threat uh, for sharks, for great white specifically, is that there is a lot of people very interested in buying their teeth or their jaws on the market. You can still find the teeth of shark, great whites even, on uh, websites like uh, for selling stuff like even Amazon. That's horrible. I mean, if just people stop to buy this kind of stuff, this will clearly improve a lot the pressure that we are creating on these animals. Even in many countries, the species are still the species is still is already protected, but there is not enough enforcement. And another fundamental pro problem is that even if we take the few countries where the species is actually protected and not just on the paper, the problem is still there because Cretoids used to eat a lot of different species of sharks. So we need the Cretoid, but also we need their food. Their food may be seals, 
dolphins, tuna, etc. But especially in the first stages of, the, of its life. And then still for the rest of their life, they use to eat a lot of species of sharks. So if we protect just the great white and we don't protect the smaller species of shark, this is still going to be a huge problem. So it's very important that people make some kind of pressure on their governments so that uh, is not going to protect uh, all the great white, but all species of sharks. Otherwise, the situation is not going to improve. And we are seeing a strong decrease, a dramatic decrease of great whites all over the world. Sharks are much better alive than dead. Because, you know, there is a lot of people that really don't care about the wild animals, especially when they are potentially dangerous as great whites. And sometimes, actually, they kill a few people. But I'm talking about less than 10 people killed in the world per year. You know, when we, we see the figure of about 10, 10 people killed per year in the world, that's apply to all species of sharks, not only great whites. So great white alone kill much less than 10 people per year. And the live great white produce a huge amount of income that is not comparable to the tiny amount that a dead great white may produce. Facts. Thank you so much, Alessandra. And we're, um, we're going to now move on to um, our next speaker, Anna Pellegrino will be our next speaker. She's going to be speaking about um, the Rocos Atal, which um, was the first marine reserve in Brazil. Anna specializes in research methodologies and management. She coordinates research and projects, um, launching initiatives for the Cali Earth. So Anna, um, over to you. So I will be speaking about Rocas Atal, which is the only atoll in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. So around the world, there are uh, 425 atolls, most of them in the Pacific Ocean. And this is the only one in the Brazilian coast in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. It was the first marine reserve in Brazil. And I'm going to show you why it's a very successful case. So an atoll is a ring-shaped island including a coral rim that encircles a lagoon partially or completed, completely. So this uh, Hawkes Atoll is sitting on a mount, uh, underwater mountain range. So just that small area is above surface, a total area of 5.5 square kilometers. So it's very small. And the total protected area is 32 hectares with a buffer zone following the 1,000 meter isobath, which is an imaginary line underwater that connects all the points in the same depth. depth. So every point that is 1,000 meter below the water surface is part of the protected area from Hawkes. This is the location, so everybody, I, I hope that everybody knows where Brazil is. And Hawkes Atoll is 267 kilometers away from the coast, from Natal, which is a, a town in Brazil, and 148 kilometers from Fernando de Noronha, which is another island that is part of the same protected area. It takes 26 hours in a boat to get from the shore in the continent to the island. In 1977, the nature reserve was first created. Uh, many studies showed that it was an important uh, sea turtle uh, reproduction area. So that made the case for, for the island to become a natural reserve, but only in 1991 that the nature reserve was actually implemented and protection measures started to be taken. And Zélia Brito, who is the unit manager, was deployed to the island to be responsible for the protection of it. At that time, they didn't have anything. It's not an inhabited island. 
it is very small. It's just a stretch of sand. So there was nobody there and no structure. The people working there, especially Zelia, they had to sleep in tents. There is no fresh water. There is no plumbing. And they had practically zero structure. So it was only her and two other people working under her on a boat, approaching uh, fishing boats without any guns, without any support, without any communication to the continent and asking them to please go away because it was a protected area. At that time, they had an average of 280 days of fishing per year in the region. And between two to 14 fishing boats per day, it was usually small boats, but still they used rods, they used nets, they used uh, air pressure guns, and that caused huge damage to the area and the, to the population of animals in the region. In 2001, the site was declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. And in 2007, finally, there was a partnership between Chico Mendes Institute, which is the government institute responsible for the reserve, and SOS Mata Atlantica, which is a nonprofit foundation that promotes public policies for the Atlantic forest in Brazil and other biomes. So with this partnership, a lot of funding started coming in. So a lot of improvement in infrastructure started to be taken to Hawkes. So today, this is what the island looks like. There, there's only one house that houses the researchers and the employees in Zelia. They have uh, solar panels for electricity and uh, batteries for nighttime. They have internet via satellite, but still no fresh water. Obviously it's a reserve, so they are not allowed to fish. So any food, any fresh water, anything that you need to, to lead a, a normal life, needs to come from the continent. So the planning uh, that you need to have for ev every time you go there and there's always someone at the island needs to be perfect or else if you need something and it's urgent, it takes 26 hours by boat to get to there. Why is it called a biological reserve? It is a very fragile environment. So that is the most restricted uh, level of preservation that an area can have in Brazil. So only research and monitoring is allowed. There are no touristic routes there. You cannot just go to the island to see what it looks like. And the island is a very important breeding nursery and nesting grounds. So any disturbance in the area on the sand around the corals can lead to tragic events. So Hawkes was, was issued the highest level of protection possible because it's a very important area. So uh, the research, since they started, there was 120 research projects already finished in the island. The vast majority of them is uh, zoological and ecological projects, but you also have people studying botanics, environmental education, management, and geology. The protection system that the island has is something from another world. Even I was amazed by how protected the island is and how people worry about it. So PREPS, is a federal government program that tracks fishing vessels with satellites. It is compulsory in Brazil that boats from 15 meters long to bigger have a tracker device on board and turned on at all times. So with a satellite, you can track all of the boats, see their their positioning in the ocean. And if it is the case, you can approach them, you can radio them and ask them to move away because they are getting too close. 
They make use of drones to monitor the, the enclosed area. They use radio to communicate with the boats. They use software and apps like marine traffic or global fishing to try to track international vessels that may approach. And there's also another governmental program called Brazil Plus that utilizes 130 satellites to monitor the, air, the, the shore and inland. It covers the whole uh, territory of Brazil, and that is also used to monitor the positioning of boats for hawkers. On top of that, we have the Brazilian Air Force and Navy monitoring the area very frequently. So we have a very good security scheme for the island to prevent that fishing occurs, which today was suppressed by 95%. They have, the last event that they had to intervene was uh, a sail race that was coming too close and they had to approach the, the sailboats, ask them to move away. But fishing was practically all suppressed, thankfully for the hard work of all those people that live in an island that wasn't supposed to have human beings living on it. They, uh, Zelia and her team, they do seabird monitoring. There are five species that nest in the island. And on top of that, you have all the species of birds that migrate and have the island en route. Currently, there are 150,000 birds nesting in two very small islands. They do sea turtles monitoring. The Hawkes Island is the second biggest reproduction stretch of sand that we have in Brazil. You have two uh, species of turtles and they, they have on average 300 nests per reproductive se uh, season. So that is a lot. We, they do sea life monitoring. Ever since the, the reserve was implemented, the population of fish started growing exponentially. The health of the corals increased. They, uh, they monitor octopuses, lobsters, which is also one of the biggest population of lobsters there are in the coast of Brazil. And you have all sorts of animals there. You have uh, crayfish, you have sharks, you have stingrays, uh, whales and dolphins that approach the island for food and protected areas for reproduction. And on top of all of that, they do also uh, a waste management because obviously the island is protected. They take care of that, but the currents bring a lot of garbage from the ocean. So they also monitor that. Most of the garbage is polymer, polymers or plastics. And most of them, when they can identify, comes from Asia. But now it's a lot of investment, obviously, especially for the, for the security of it. And obviously, it's not going to be invested just because it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful island and you have a lot of beautiful animals swimming around. The, import, the great importance of keeping hawkers intact is financial, but not locally. The surplus of fish that reproduce on the island and swim away contributes to the fishing industry in three Brazilian states. So even though you don't have uh, financial exploration and tourism and commerce in the island itself, I can safely say that millions of people get the, the profits from it through other industries. So maintaining hawkers intact as it is now is, has a social economic importance that cannot be measured. I want to finish with this uh, answer that Zelia gave in an in interview. They asked her what conservation means. And she said that conservation for her is having the ability to protect lives. For hawkers at all, it means perpetuity. 
it's being able to contribute in a way so that endangered or not endangered species can live fully in peace. So I want to I want to finish this presentation saying that preserving hotspot areas doesn't mean that people won't have access to it or that it will be taken away from us just for the sake of protecting one place. The profits that we can get by protecting those places are way larger than just using the places until that they have nothing else to offer. So let's keep that in mind that by protecting small areas, we are saving not only those areas and those animals, but we are saving ourselves in the process. Thank you very much. Anna, thank you so much. It's so nice to hear this um, good news story and um, to learn about Raqqa. So it's really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to our next speaker, which is um, Yanela Mahamba. And she is um, our final speaker. Um, she's involved in conducting scientific research and monitoring the Marine Protected Areas or MPAs around some of Southern, South Africa's most spectacular sites. So welcome, Yanela. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Fiji, for the introductions. So today I'll be sharing with you about the conservation and economic value of the marine protected areas. But before we dive into that, let's look into why we should be uh, protecting the oceans. Uh, we know that humans in the oceans and climate and biodiversity, they are sort of like inseparable, inseparable. they are linked together. We know that the ocean is um, home to about 90% of biodiversity, habitats that contain unique life forms and um, genetic resources that provide medicine. And also there are various ecosystem services that we get from the oceans. Um, and it also covers about 70% of the planet Earth. Uh, some of the ecosystem services that we get from the ocean is um, oxygen. We know that we've got the marine phyto phytoplankton and, the, and other primary producers that provide us with uh, more than 70% of oxygen. We do get food from uh, marine living resources and it also acts as a mode of transport from, for goods and services. And then we've got regulating services like um, the protection from storm surges or extreme weather events. It also regulates uh, climate change. We know that the ocean acts as a carbon sink for extreme heat and also carbon dioxide that is exacerbated by the human induced activities such as burning of fossil fuels. We also get um, the cultural services, which include the recreation and spiritual. We know when you go to the ocean, you sort of like need that calmness, the sense of place. For the oceans to continue to provide us with these amazing and important um, ecosystem services, we also need, uh, they, they also need to be on a healthy state, but there are various factors or threats that are posed to the oceans. I've highlighted a few from these ones, uh, which one of them is the illegal exploitation of marine resources. We've got marine pollution from land-based uh, from land-based sources that ends up at sea. We also have with the increased ship traffic that also pose a threat to marine pollution, like the oil spills. We've got habitat destruction. We know we've got illegal fishing gears that also end up at sea. We've got entanglement, especially with seabeds, tackles, and other marine life that are affected by the habitat destruction. There is also a threat of climate change. We know that due to the increase in the activities of humans, um, there is also an increase in carbon dioxide and also increase in temperatures that end up at sea. So some of these things, as Julie has mentioned in, his, in her presentation, that the increased temperatures also lead to deoxygenation. So that is also made, uh, caused by the anthropogenic factors. We also have the increased um, carbon dioxide that can also lead to ocean acidification that also affect mainly the coral reefs and the shell organisms. We also have increasing impact of marine invasive species such as the Matillus uh, galloprovincialis, which is the Mediterranean mussel, which is a huge impact in South African um, intertidal 
habitats. We also have um, lots of predators like the great white sharks that Alexandro has spoken about. We know that the apex predators, they play a huge role in shaping the marine food chain or the ecosystem or the habitats. So now that if we lose these apex predators, that means we're gonna have a shift into these um, food chains. So in order for, for the researchers and scientists to try and mitigate these impacts, we, they, they implemented the marine protected areas, which is a conservation tool that is used to conserve the marine protected areas. So in short, when we define the marine protected areas, those are geographical areas of the oceans or coastline that are legally protected uh, for conservation purposes. And in South Africa, the marine protected areas are zoned to sort of like balance the social economic and the ecological needs of, of, of humans. So um, the marine protected areas in South Africa are zoned into control zones and restricted zones. So we might also have the central zones which act as a sort of like a necessary ground for, for exploited fish species. So I'm going to explain the, the control zone first. So control zone are the areas where access is allowed and some act, um, activities that are allowed to provide that one has got a permit to get into the a valid permit that to, to get into the MPA so that the permit uh, will allow you to practice certain activities such as fishing. But for you to do that, you need to stick to um, the maybe like bed limits, the minimum size limits, and also using selective um, gears. Restricted zones, those ones are not take zones um, that are completely specific to allow the recovery of species, of marine species. And then um, in South Africa before 2019, we had um, less than 1% of the our coastline and the ocean protected. Uh, but after 2019, around August, we had our new 20 MPAs that were declared, and that took us to more than 5% of the territory that, that is now protected. However, we are still far from, the, from reaching the IEG Biodiversity Target 11, and as well as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 14.5, which, which aims at protecting at least 10% of the uh, coast, coast and marine waters um, by 20, that was by 2020, but now because we couldn't reach that in 2020, we are targeting 2030. Otherwise, there are other countries that have already reached their 10% and are now looking to 30 by 30. So now we're looking at some of the uh, benefits that we get from the marine protected areas. So we know that they protect critical habitats for reproduction and um, growth of threatened uh, species. Uh, for instance, we've got uh, some AP MPA such as the um, Robben Island Table Mountain National Park MPA that are dedicated to protect um, IUCN red listed seabed species like your Cape Comorans. African penguins, endangered African penguins, and Cape Gannets. Um, the MPA is also maintained by diversity and provide a refuge for exploited commercial species. We've got in South Africa the West Coast rock lobster and the South African abalone, which are of huge interest to the uh, economy of South Africa. So those ones are also protected, especially in Table Mountain National Park in Hout Bay. Uh, so, so far, Hard Bay is the only Intermountain National Park is the only zone that still has the healthy um, abalone population. So they also protect the cultural diversity, such as the shell middens, the sheep wrecks, and archaeological sites. And then they also offer appropriate um, environment and opportunity to conduct research and education. Now I've, quanti I've took in some papers that have quantified the benefits of the marine protected areas in South Africa. I'm gonna first look into the ecological or biodiversity or conservation aspect of it. 
Um, we know that from the data or the research, it has scientifically proven that uh, the MPAs are effective tool for conservation of biodiversity. Um, this is where that they've looked into uh, the size of the species, the abundance of the species, but they found to be higher in restricted or no take zone um, compared to open zone or controlled zones. And then they also noted that the no take zone or restricted zone within the MPA um, uh, have protected uh, some of the species such as the sharks, um, the vulnerable shark species like the smooth hound shark, from fishing during their packing season and some of the species like the white stem nose that is um, you, you'd find throughout the South African coastline has been protected uh, during the spawning season. Um, and they also protect threatened ecosystems and habitat. Um, so I've put in a few papers here where you can um, sort of like get an idea of um, how far are we in terms of um, documenting or collecting data from um, a research that has been done in quantifying the effect, the ecological effectiveness of the marine protected areas. And then we look into the socioeconomic benefits or aspects of the marine protected areas. Uh, we know that they provide huge ecotourism opportunities, such as the penguin watching in Boulders Beach um, here in Table Mountain National Park. There's also opportunities for whale washing, scuba diving in the KZN in East Mangaliso Wetland um, uh, MPA. There's also shark cage diving that Alexandra has highlighted. So all of these uh, opportunities, they sort of like contribute to the local economy as well as sort of like create um, job opportunities for communities, especially the communities that are adjacent to, to the MPAs. And they also provide food security. And there's also a spillover effect, but there hasn't been much research on this one. But the paper that I've put here by Spin Kewat, where they were looking into the spillover effect um, in Gogagama MPA. So they found that it does um, sort of like assist the fisheries around the MPA um, because you get the adult fish that are migrating from the no take zone to, to the open zones or into the controlled zones. Just to highlight here that one of the MPAs that we're currently monitoring, which is the Table Mountain National Park, there's this popular documentary, My Octopus Teacher, that was filmed here in, in Table Mountain National Park. So some of the lessons that we've learned so far uh, since the implementation of the MPAs is that um, in as much as the MPA has proved to be effective tool uh, to support biodiversity, we still need some baseline data to quantify the effectiveness of the marine protected areas. In some instances, the no take zones or restricted zones are usually smaller than the controlled zones, which sort of like make it difficult for us to quantify whether the marine protected areas are effective or they sort of like meet the objectives that are set for the MPA. And we also maybe in future, through collecting the baseline data, we can also reconsider maybe rezoning, whether expanding the, the zones that are already there, and also need to strengthen the uh, stakeholder engagement and the relationship um, with the adjacent coastal communities, and also strengthen the co-management committee, such as the users and the authorities. So one of the most important aspects of the MPA is the social economic aspect of it. Um, uh, so we, there's a need to enhance compliance, whether through by taking social economic um, aspect into consideration in areas impacted by the MPAs, whether that one will be through um, alternative livelihoods, employment opportunities, and also like strengthening relationship and also sort of like we um, have a good understanding in terms of access within the, the MPA because in some, in some cases they do feel like they don't, they sort of like restricted to access the marine protected area. 
And before I close off, uh, these are some of the things that we can sort of like practice to make a difference in order to sort of like sustain the marine environment for future generations. I've highlighted there is um, South African Sustainable um, Seafood Initiative, uh, which looks at um, this one, you can download, it's freely available. So when you go buy your seafood, you can sort of like check how the species was caught, what state is it maybe like an endangered species, should it be available um, at the market or not? And then if it has got this blue label here, the certified sustainable seafood, then that means you are choosing your seafood correctly. And another important component is education and awareness. Um, so such as this webinar that we are having here, so we can have these webinars, we can do environmental education, we can participate in the environmental days, such as the, um, the World Ocean Days, the Marine Week. All of these environmental days are important in terms of um, equipping ourselves and with knowledge. And also, we also need to sort of like just when you're walking on the beach or even in your house, you can sort of like clean and be responsible where you sort of like dump your, your litter. And also need to practice um, reuse the triple R's, reuse, reduce, and recycle. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Yanela, thank you so much. I also absolutely loved um, my octopus teacher and I highly recommend it um, to anyone. And it makes it even more special that it um, was filmed out off the Table Mountain coast. Um, so off in South Africa. So that's really lovely. Thank you. And um, we don't have that much time for too many questions. Uh, um, but I think I'll just ask a specific question. Yanella, you've already um, answered it, but maybe to Tuli and Anna, who are still on the call, um, just a general question about specifically what, you know, I could do to help save the ocean. You know, what, what specifically can individuals who are on the call do, um, you know, to, to help save the oceans? And then also, Anna, you were specifically asked um, in the chat where people could go to find more information about um, the Rocco Atoll. Okay, let me answer that first. I sent a, a website on the chat. It's a very thorough website with all the information, even the historical uh, background of the island when the Portuguese first arrived in Brazil, the geological studies and everything. So it's in the chat. You're welcome to take a look. And from there, there are other websites that you can go and explore more. And um, can you answer the question? Like if you, like the one thing that you would say to the audience that um, they could do to help um, revitalize the ocean, what would you, what advice would you give? Uh, as individuals, not institutions with, huge funding and all of that, I would suggest to maybe do one day, one meatless day, one fishless day, because fish stocks are decreasing and we can help by decreasing our consumption of it. And then the pressure on the oceans will decrease as well. That you can start doing today. And also pay attention of how you dispose your garbage Look for recycling companies. Check if there's a recycling route around your neighborhood. Separate your garbage. Those just look like very small actions. I, for example, started cutting the ring of plastic bottles because that, that takes five seconds to me, but it might save a life of an animal that will get choked by it. So every single ring of a product that arrives in my house, gets out of my house, cut open. That's great advice, thank you. Thank you, Anna. And Tule, um, do you have any last um, words of advice for us? Um, I'm gonna agree with Anna on the, or all of her points are great, but specifically the meatless, one meatless day a week, if you can do that, especially since, um, my topic specifically spoke about agriculture. So the mm -hmm. fact that we need to produce 
food for the meat we eat t- is more agriculture. So if you can n- take off one day from meat, any form of meat, that would be great too. And um, an easy thing I think most people can do, especially if, if you have a pet, uh, clean up your pet waste because if that makes it into a water waste, that's more pollution. So I think that's something that people with pets can do. Um, yeah. That's-, that's great. Thank you all so much for being here today. And I hope you've um, enjoyed the webinar and had some inspiration to take action, look for opportunities to collaborate and participate and maybe fund um, some important research activities. Um, we've got our next webinar coming up in September. So um, we're taking a little break over the um, English summer, Um, but um, we look forward to seeing you then. And thank you everyone for joining us and have a good day.